Thank you so much for joining today's virtual Weizmann School Talk. Better is Temporary with John Hoke, Chief Design Officer at Nike, moderated by Sarah Rotenberg, an adjunct assistant professor and executive director in the Integrated Product Design Program at the University of Pennsylvania. Today's talk will explore issues of equity and access in design and dive into how creativity shapes a more desir desirable future. John will speak on his own career journey into Nike, the design principles and values he inculcated there, and why the value of critical thinking and critical problem solving endures. We ask all attendees to feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves. One small note, please be sure that you send your chat to all attendees and participants and include your name, where you live, and your degree, and your year if you're an alumnus. And during the discussion, please write any questions into the Q&A chat function. Now I'd like to introduce Sarah, who will moderate today's talk. Sarah oversees the Integrated Product Design Program at Penn, a master's program that bridges design, business, and engineering. Sarah specializes in bringing people together to, to design products and experiences that are desirable, meaningful, feasible, and viable. She is adept at articulating design processes and methods, teaching design thinking and design process to students across the university. Sarah began her career as a design strategist at Dublin Incorporated and was a directing associate at Jump Associates. She has a master's in social sciences from the University of Chicago and a bachelor's from Georgetown University. Okay, all right, Sarah. Thanks so much for the introduction, Charlotte. And welcome everyone. I'm thrilled to again be a virtual talk moderator and to see so many familiar faces joining us today. It's always a pleasure for me to get a chance to talk with John and to hear about the work that he does at Nike. And I'm sure it's gonna be a pleasure for all of you as well. John Hoke currently serves as Nike Inc's chief design officer. In this role, he leads Nike's global design team responsible for envisioning the future of sport. John directs an international creative community of over a thousand designers charged with inspiring and innovating while designing hundreds of apparel and footwear styles each year. John promotes, speaks, and writes about the power and possibility of design and creativity throughout the world. He's a permanent design fellow at Pennsylvania State University, his alma mater, a member of Herman Miller Inc's board of directors, an advisor to Piaggio Fast Forward, and a trustee at the Pacific Northwest College of Art. John also served as a national trustee of Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Prior to Nike, John was a designer at Michael Graves Architecture and Design in Princeton, New Jersey. His work included architectural, industrial, and graphic design products for a variety of international clientele. Mr. Graves served as a personal mentor to John until his death in 2015. John holds degrees from Pennsylvania State University, BARC, University of Pennsylvania, MARC, and Stanford University, MBA. Outside of Nike, John dabbles in his sketchbook and computer, snowboards, mountain bikes, and runs. He enjoys time spent with his wife and three adult sons, and we're incredibly grateful to him for spending the time together with us today. So welcome, John. I look forward to hearing from you and to having a conversation with you today. Well, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Charlotte, for that wonderful introduction. It's um, it's truly an honor to be here with all of you in this space, in this moment. Um, so, so thank you for that. You know, I, I want to begin by just saying um, I've been I've had folks reach out to me from my uh, class at Penn and give me a chance to think about what what happened at Penn for me. And as as I dive into this conversation, I think it's really important that I stop and say uh, how wonderful my education was and. The, the training that I received at Penn, I use up to today, right? The critical creative thinking process and um, something that I try to drive at Nike, which was st stemmed from my conversations and dialogue and, and research at Penn was the notion of examination, exploration and experimentation, something that the school had instilled in all of us as, as students to, to find new ground, to find new space, to connect problems and solutions in really unique ways. So um, that was really, you know, the result of me being with my classmates and my faculty and my coursework uh, back in 1992. And so I'm forever grateful 
with the, the wonderful education that I received. Um, I, I do often talk about what Penn has provided to me in the journey of my career. I came from my phrase, which I'll speak to in a second. And I took the year to come to Penn and spend some time tilling my own creative soil, helping me to learn and unlearn certain things and prepare myself for uh, a career leading design. And um, again, so grateful and so humbled to be here. Thank you both. The way that we're going to do this, I have a, a very short presentation to, uh, to share with you. And, and that presentation will give you a, a quick glimpse into my own personal history and journey. Uh, I'm happy to share some of the work that we've done over the last 12 months. And from there, um, I look forward to a conversation with Sarah. Uh, she and I've had a couple of great conversations before this. And I do want to thank the university, Sarah and Jenny and Charlotte. Thank you for your, your grace and um, letting this schedule get finally figured out with my calendar. It's been difficult, but, um, but I'm, I'm grateful to be here. So with that, I'm going to do you all the um, share my screen thing. There it goes. And I am hoping you see this. And I'm going to start here. OK, so the talk this morning is um, entitled Better is Temporary. And Better is Temporary is a recent book that was done with Fight on Press. Um, and this notion of better as temporary is li literally thinking about the work that we do at Nike, reflective on where athletes are and what athletes demand from our company and themselves is they attack records and they push out boundaries and they break down barriers. And I've learned in my 30 years that once a record is made, uh, somebody's chasing it. So in sports, much like in design, best, is really temporary because we dwell between sports and as designers pushing the progression of what's possible. So uh, that has become a constant theme and I'll speak to that when we talk um, with Sarah. So, you know, I, I wanted to share with you my own personal journey and I begin my journey by uh, saying that I am in fact dyslexic. And so as a dyslexic boy, and man, you know, this, the challenges that I had as a young boy were trouble, obviously, uh, regard to reading and writing. And, you know, I, I do often say that my native tongue, my first language was drawing. And I spent most of my uh, young years doodling and sketching anything to try to figure it all out. And so um, there were two important bookends in my creative journey in my life. One is uh, the, the photograph you see, I think, on your left. It's funny because I have the exact same haircut that I had nearly 55 years ago. Um, this is a picture of me as a baby. And my mom used to say to me, she loved this photograph because she said, you just see the world differently. And because I'm dyslexic, it was this node to like thinking differently and looking at the world backwards, upside down, etc. So drawing and the love of art as an expression became central and an important bookend to my life. The other on the right was being an athlete and being an athlete focused on how can I improve my athletics uh, was very interesting to me. So those two things basically guided my upbringing uh, as, a, as a young boy. And there's a story of how I got to Nike and it goes something like this. One summer I was floating on a raft and I said, what if I shrank this raft and I put it under my foot and I began to draw sneakers. I, I was drawing sneakers. I walked into my father's office and I said, I've got an idea for air cushioning under the foot. He said, that's kind of a cool idea. What do you want to do? And I said, well, actually, I want to send it to this company. And I brought in this orange box, Nike. And we looked up in the library and I said, Phil Knight. And I wrote Phil Knight a letter. Uh, and I said, I've got an idea for cushioning in, in your shoes. And didn't think anything of it, sent it away. This is in the mid 70s. Um, you had to go to a library and look things up, like addresses, et cetera. And lo and behold, Nike sent me a letter back. And that letter back, um, in essence, you can see on the left, 1979, hey, we got your idea, kind of cool. And on the right is the letter I received coming out of the University of Pennsylvania to be 
uh, hired as a designer. So in many ways, this is a manifest destiny, but I often use this because of the power of creative thinking at a young age, uh, using your imagination, being able to reach out to individuals and have them reach back. This became an indelible mark in my life. And when I graduated from Penn State, I had a chance to go work in the office of Michael Graves in the mid to late 80s, uh, a prominent office at the time based in Princeton, New Jersey. And, you know, I have probably half a dozen rejection letters from his office telling me that there was no work. Finally, there was a bulletin board um, outside of our studio at Penn State. And on the bulletin board was um, a memo looking for a model maker. And I decided to go try to get this job being a model maker for Michael Graves. Uh, after a lot of hard work, a lot of hustle, I actually got down to Princeton and was able to be in front of the organization and I was hired to be the model maker. I showed up a few weeks after graduation and came to quickly learn that the model maker was probably the lowest on the pecking order. <laughs> But the best news is I got to sit incredibly close to an American master and learn his proportion, his composition, the way he thought about form and shape and surface, et cetera. And then eventually worked my way upstairs, literally out of the basement into becoming uh, an architect industrial designer for his office. And I had an amazing um, opportunity to kind of learn hands-on and do exhibit work, furniture, custom houses, uh, you, you name it. The office was filled with work, so we were able to do lots of different things. And I was lucky to have had the chance to have him, again, help and sh shape who I am as a, as a creative thinker and love of, of drawing and help me to produce um, not just a, a love of architecture, but the love of design. So, I'm going to start here in regard to our work at Nike. We were given a gift by our co-founder, Phil Knight, the now chair emeritus. And this gift is our truest North Star at our company, specifically as designers and innovators. We always listen to the voice of the athlete. What that does for us, it helps us better understand their problem sets, their ambitions, their needs, their wants, their desires. And we turn those into a series of problem sets, which we then go solve with solutions. And so this has been a part of our teaching for nearly 50 years as an organization, always listening to the voice of the athlete. There's an asterisk on the end of this statement because we view athletes as everybody. Anybody who's on the planet, we believe can be an athlete to find his or her potential. So a couple of quick examples of the work. This is Ilya Kipchoge, and this is the shoe he helped us create to break the two hour marathon barrier. Pretty incredible work. Our latest work, this will be showing up in Tokyo in a few months now for the Tokyo Olympics, our medal stands, et cetera. Some work with our Nike Pro Hijab, one of our, our athletes in the US pushing the boundaries. Same thing with this Nike Go Fly Ease, which is a, an easy on, easy off shoe. We're also focused on finding areas where sports are, people are not invited to sports and we're figuring out ways to help them uh, become athletic. I'm really lucky because I get to work with the world's best athletes and what the world's best athletes will tell us over and over again, whether it's the firebrand of Prefontaine, uh, an artist, an advocate, and uh, an athlete in Serena or the world's best basketball players, they push us, they push our design team, they push me to help reminding my team that better is temporary. There's always a chance to go further. There's always a chance to break down a barrier, whether that's a world record, whether that's access to sports, whether that's creating equality in sports, whether that's uniting under certain flags around sustainability and equity, very, very important to our organization. And then this next slide will just show you a little bit of some of the designs and innovations that we've worked on in the last 12 months that we are particularly proud of. Uh, the first is the, the fly print. Uh, this is something we do with new technologies. Our hyper adapt is a new in shoe experience uh, using the, the technology to close open and close. ISPA is a new way of thinking about our product, how we assemble and scavenge. 
Of course, we're hyper-focused on sustainability and having less of an impact with our high-performance product. Space Hippie was a, was a product line we dropped a year ago. This is about turning trash into gold. We work with some of the world's best um, thinkers and creatives. This is a Travis Scott collection. And of course, Matthew Williams, one of our uh, elite collaborators helping us rethink a camouflage. So what's amazing to me is that in all these instances, we leverage technology, we leverage imagination, we leverage creativity and problem solving. And that comes to life in a meaningful and emotional design package that deeply resonates with our consumers. So with that, uh, as a short opening, I just wanted to again say thank you all for being in this space with us. And I'm going to now stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, John. That was, um, I could just stare at those images for the next 40 minutes happily. Um, but I think we're probably it's better just off. A, it's just a fraction of the work that, that we're able to do. But but I think it's it's illustrative because it, it does speak to the breadth and the depth of the work that, that our teams are focused on, which is again incredibly exciting. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I'll kick off with some some questions, maybe double clicking on some of the examples that you shared and also some additional questions. And I want to invite all of our guests to also um, share whatever questions they have. So in the Q&A, if you put your questions in there, I'll kind of synthesize them and summarize them um, and weave them into the conversation. And we definitely want to hear from you what you're interested in um, as well. Um, but maybe I'll start. And if, if it's OK, I'll start with something that wasn't in the presentation, but that I see on your desk right now. I see that your closest workmate now is Wilson. Um, yeah. And I know that all of us, um, who we work with and how we work together has changed a lot over the past year. Um, so how have your collaborative models changed or evolved over the past year? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, Wilson's been with me a little while. Uh, if you knew the movie Castaway, you recognize that I'm sitting in the Nike campus, which is built for roughly 25,000 people. I think today I'm one of four or five people on the campus. So in my own right, I feel a bit like a castaway, Sarah. So a friend of mine sent me that um, as, as a gag gift. So, you know, so much has changed, Sarah. I, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to pinpoint any specific thing. If I could, could I start off with what hasn't changed? So okay. what hasn't changed for us at Nike and Nike Design is that truest north. Uh, we solve problems for athletes, and, and those problems um, are growing exponentially. And they're not simply functional problems. They're, they're problems around um, beauty and aesthetics. They're problems around access to sports. They're problems um, around functionality, utility, et cetera. And they're problems around uh, end of life stage. So those are all those are all front and center for us. You know, we have a thousand creatives at this company, uh, inclusive of Jordan and Converse, and we have a very large design studio. And you know, we we are, as a community, bonded by creativity. Uh, we have a very diverse set of creatives all over the world, and that common bond is, and what we share together as a creative collective is, how can we make the world better? How can we have a better impact? through our designs on the fields of play and then expand beyond sports into supporting a, a culture. We, we do have um, something we call our design ethos, which is something that, that I help work with my leadership team on that guides and shapes a set of principles, how we design and cultural values, how we think as creatives. And those two things become important table stakes for all of our designers because we do make a lot of designs, products, uh, think marketing messages, think physical retail stores, now digital stores. And we want a handwriting that's threaded throughout this entire expression of our company. Um, I'll say one thing that, that is important to me and then I can pivot to what's changed. So I, I try to live with wonder. I, I always have, that's just been the, my orientation to the world. And, and we teach that living with wonder. Um, to our teams. And if you live with wonder and you dare greatly um, to change and have an impact, 
we have something we call our own AI, not an artificial intelligence, but an audacious imagination, bold thinking, mm -hmm. bold thinking that is that dares big, dreams big, dares big, and then does things in, in a big way. So the, the three legs of that stool for us, if I were to come, come down to just a couple of sound bites, we're always problem solving. That is, that is central to us as designers. But we blend that with taste making. We know that uh, utility is not enough. Utility and beauty have to go hand in hand. And now more than ever, we breathe life of emotion into products so that there is an emotional appeal, an emotional accord to products that we create or experiences that we make. So that, that is something that I, I would tell you it, it hasn't changed, but what has changed through the pandemic and my observations and I'm proud to say, and I'd like to take an optimistic tone here of hope, I believe we are closing in on the beginnings of the ends of the pandemic. Uh, and I suspect like most on the call, uh, revel and look forward to that, um, that new normal that we create. So what I've observed, Sarah, is this idea that creativity will not be quarantined. And, and when we say that, what I've found is our designers, albeit working from home, wherever that may be, and they've been doing this for roughly 12 months, there's a level of creative resilience and adaptability and, and, and agility and authenticity that remains really strong in our community. And even working remotely from home, uh, finding new technologies to connect on, has, has been breathtaking to see the, the team move from where we were to where we are. And, you know, I don't say this lightly, change is hard. And we, we all got a dose of change a year ago. And at, at Nike, change is not just hard. Change is our advantage and change is our business. Yeah. So I, I, it's been great to see the teams be able to uh, be resilient and reflect uh, in a different way, how to be creative. Um, I've seen some amazing resources and some even more incredible resourcefulness <laughs> of how people design from their studios at home. Um, and and at, at the end of the day, I think, you know, the collaborative mode is this collective genius. The problems that we face mm -hmm. together are large. And I don't believe any one singular stroke of a pen or one singular idea is enough. The creative collective and the way that we work today brings powerful ideas together and more and more interest and more intelligence makes the solution even stronger. Um, I've also, you know, I've, I've witnessed our community attacking some of the big villains in the pandemic, you know, solving for isolation, solving for deprivation, polarization, all the things that are, we're challenged with. I'm seeing the community rise to that occasion as a groundswell. And I, we, we have um, this belief now that, that the Phoenix, will, the Phoenix, if you will, will be the next muse for us. The Fe rising from uh, this troubling time, will be uh, important for the next generation of sports to, to have athletes and Nike reimagine what sports can be. I mean, I think that's so meaningful. I, I think sports have still remained such an important part of people's lives, even in this challenging time. It's interesting to hear you talk about um, the kind of strong culture and the mindsets of creativity, it sounds like that transcends whether you're working together in a physical location or working together in a digital location. Um, and the other thing I'm hearing from you is something I've seen a little bit in my students as well, which is like these kind of creative problem solving techniques that we use in our work are also the same thing techniques we've been able to bring to bear on solving what are the new ways in which we work together and, and how do we collaborate in new ways and how do we adopt new tools into our practices. So. I do kind of feel that um, like as designers, we're kind of well positioned for reinvention of how we work because we're constantly reinventing things as we work. Yeah, and you're hundred percent right. And that's why you know, I always say that one of the most powerful tools in a designer's uh, tool belt is this notion of curiosity and asking questions mm -hmm. followed up by the idea that um, change is inevitable. And so being agile and adjustable and adaptable to whatever the context is, whatever the situation is, 
is, is critical. Uh, so I think as, as all of you think about your careers, your studios, your work, um, just know change is coming and, and don't fear it. Um, embrace it and run towards that change. That, that, that's where the answers are going to be. And, and you know, something you just said, uh, Sarah, to me, you know, just, I, I have always believed that creativity is the ultimate act of optimism, right? And so the world is looking for um, solutions and looking for an, an anchor point to sit, kind of go, okay, so this is going to be better. And the role that designers play as citizen designers, uh, trying to have an impact to, to create positive momentum and change is, is central to us and central to who we are as designers. You know, as designers, we, we possess a social contract and that contract is to, to work with empathy and to solve problems for others. It's different than being an artist. That contract is within. I'm satisfying myself, I'm expressing a feeling, but as a designer, empathic design, we, we are looking to solve others' problems. And I just think that's absolutely uh, central to the future. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I love the concept that, that we're all citizen designers. We've taken on kind of um, a responsibility for the things that we design and how they can help impact the world. Um, building on your um, comments about kind of the need for wonder and imagination, um, one of the guests asked, um, how do you stimulate your wonder and imagination? And have you read anything recently that you would recommend? What are the things you do to kind of feed those creative juices? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I just, I believe it's an orientation and a mindset. You know, um, the mindset that I have is that I don't presume to know a lot at all. I presume to be really curious. And because of that, I, I seek to know more. And um, I kind of, I sort of wake up with that. Like what, what's going on? What don't I know? Um, what, can I, what do I need to go learn to be better today? And, and that, that orientation uh, <laughs> is with me 24 um, seven. I'm reading several, um, several little books. Um, I'm going to forget the name of the book that I've just been picking at for quite some time. Um, I believe the book is uh, Are We Human? It's Mark Wigley and Beatrice Colomina out of Princeton. And I've, I found that book to be very, very powerful because it sort of explores the depths and dimensions of humanity and human design partnered with uh, the emergent technologies that we, we are. And and, and are we human or do we stay human to me is, is quite interesting, you know, that we'd be at, we're at this position now where we have this potential partnership uh, and it, it doesn't have to be adversarial, but a partnership with technologies that are, you know, rapidly changing the way we think, explore, experiment with space and product, et cetera. I, I find that to be really interesting. I, I also have been reading a book, Longing for Less, and, um, and I'm going to forget the name of the author, and the book is at home, I apologize, but this is a, a study of um, reduction, right, and, and it's been almost a book of meditation. I've, I've savored every page, I've really highlighted every page, because, and I've annotated things in there, what, what this means to, to long for less, to look, to seek simplification, if you will. And it doesn't mean denial, it means selection. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be quite powerful. That's a great question, thank you. And that's interesting, this concept of, of longing for less. I think sometimes we have this assumption that um, as designers, especially designers who create new products, right? We're always wanting more, but what is the right balance between better, different, more, you know, balancing, um, what I think, I think good design does require restraint and, um, you know, um, Dieter Ram's less is more, um, but like weaving that in um, as a designer, you know, probably asks you, uh, causes you to ask yourself some questions about what am I making and why am I making it and how am I making it in the world? Um, you showed some examples of the products that you guys are creating um, to strike this balance between creating less 
but also still creating more and creating new. Um, and you just kind of touched on that space hippie product. Um, and I was really struck by this idea of trash to gold. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what you're doing there? Yeah, this is um, Space Hippie is a product collection that we uh, dropped right before the pandemic started in our uh, New York showroom as a launch to the Tokyo 20, what would have been 2020 games, uh, now 2021 games. And it's kind of the culmination of a, a lot of research around how could we uh, take back trash. And this is primarily a combination of post-consumer trash and uh, scraps on the factory floor, recognizing that this is unused material at this point. And so how could we uh, constrain ourselves by thinking of bringing or breathing new life into this material? And Space Hippie as a concept was kind of a, a brainchild of our innovation group. And, and the constraint that we gave ourselves was if you were in space in a capsule and you had a problem, you know, Houston, we have a problem. All you have to solve it is what's around you. So we literally said, this is all we have to solve. There's nothing else. You can't get anything else. These are the raw materials you have to create uh, a new product. And, you know, the space hippie product is just that it's constrained by, by this, these, these are the materials. And then it looked at new ways of using reground material, so bringing material back to its its essence, and then not 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 losing or not compromising both the aesthetics and the, the functionality. And it's a great first step. You know, it's by no means done. We have continuously we've been working on sustainability for nearly twenty years. So this is just another chapter in that effort. Um, I'm really proud of it because of what it stands for, which is we believe we can make matter matter even more by collecting it and reimagining it over and over and over again. In essence, begin to think about a service agreement between a consumer and, and a company. So that our, our job essentially is to turn that matter over and, and, and make that, it was a ball, now it's a shoe, then it's a shirt, then it's a, it's a bottle, then it's a bag, et cetera. And I find that to be um, quite interesting. It's a part of our circular design effort that we've been launched, that we have launched in the last several years, which is in essence, um, it, it starts with the goal that we believe that sport is a birthright for every generation. And we believe therefore part of our job is to protect the future of sport. And the future of sport is played on the playground of planet earth. And so how do we, have people playing sports with an even um, a less impact on the, the, the planet around us. Again, no compromises. So we want to make sure that the products work, but um, that, that's why I, I keep coming back to this idea of being a citizen designer, solving problems for citizen athletes. And, and the citizen notion is we all have a role and we all have a responsibility to do this together. And, and, and that reciprocity back and forth will make us all better. It'll make us better consumers, make us better designers. It keeps pushing the bar forward. And the last thing on this, you know, um, when I was in school and, and for quite some time, a part of the, the design mantle was this notion of form follows function, right? The utility and the beauty were married together, uh, essentially. And that was good design, right? And, and today, I don't think that's enough. So uh, what I've been saying with Nike is form and function follow footprint. That's another constraint. Utility, beauty, and responsibility create great design. And as designers, we have to be extremely thoughtful about the choices that we make, the designs that we create, how how we select materiality, how we design details, garments, sneakers, bicycles, whatever it is, that is as important as a designer as anything else. And how do those kinds of conversations internally start to impact the kind of conversations you're having externally, like whether it's with your suppliers or even with consumers or with athletes? Yeah, great question, Sarah. It, you know, 
again, if I think about Space Hippie, it starts with, I'll call it a skunk works group, uh, having a set of convictions around what can we do to have an impact and what might that impact look like, feel like, and experientially be to the consumer. And as it moves through our design and creative process, we begin to see uh, and pick up other individuals who are interested, our, our factory partners, our developers in-house, our sub suppliers, our material suppliers. And when we paint the big vision, the big picture, um, it doesn't make it easier necessarily, but it's compelling because all of us in this value chain are also humans and are also citizens on the planet. And we all seek to do uh, a heck of a lot more with a heck of a lot less. So that rally cry becomes important. And then when we talk to our consumers, we'd like to continuously bring a level of education intelligence to them too. This is how, this is how we're thinking. This is how we're creating now. And I think when we do those types of exercises, you know, what I found is that we have a smarter consumer, a consumer who's more interested in the complete holistic solution set, which is a good thing. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit because there's a lot of questions that I would fall, I would group under the uh, career advice <laughs> section category. Um, so one of them is um, curiosity about your transition from architecture to working at Nike. Um, so what drove that transition and how did you make that transition? And it sounds like it wasn't one-to-one, -one, there was a path. Yeah. Um... That's a great question. You know, so what in my undergraduate degree at Penn State, I was very much trained as an architect uh, with the goal being uh, go produce buildings. And um, I took an interesting step uh, as a left hand turn to work for Michael Graves. And when I got to Michael Graves' office, the fascinating thing was he was doing everything from the buildings to the graphics to the tableware to the lighting to the rugs and that was just exciting and i hadn't really felt if you will all the different arenas that we could be designing into so i would say that my fascination in thinking more expansively beyond the built environment started in my very first day at michael graves uh, walking into that creative um, uh, tent and just seeing what's possible, right? That that sparked a Being lot. That tent could be. Yeah, and you know, I I went to Penn, and when I when I went to Penn, you know, I, I was very intentional. I said, you know, I'm I'm coming to this school to to learn that critical creative thinking, and I want the application to transcend architecture. Mm -hmm. And, and that was very intentional. Um, I, I knew in my writings and my work and my projects that I was exploring form, shape, surface, make materiality, um, utility and beauty for other things. It wasn't simply a building and, and that stuck with me. Um, and, you know, my first few jobs within the company was to build to be an architect, to build our Nike town programs. And I was so lucky, I was 28 years old, <laughs> building massive buildings with you know other architects, but I was exploring the interiors and the furniture and the messaging and the videos and, and the products. And then over time, you know, all throughout my career, I was doodling sneakers. And I, I, I do it to this day, I would share with you my, my notebooks, but they're kind of buried here. Um, Trust me, they're filled with everything from a building to, <laughs> to clothing to sneakers. I just, I, I've never really wanted to exclusively focus on architecture. I love architecture. Um, I think it's a, a beautiful profession and an even better education, but it's the application of that thinking to other parts of the business mm -hmm. that I find really quite intriguing and, and freeing to me, to be honest with you. I'm not sure if that answered the question. I think panel. it did. I mean, I, I think um, it sounds like you're saying a lot of foundational skills in architecture are relevant to design at different types of scale and scope, which I think is valuable for architecture students to keep in mind. Um, there's definitely a couple of folks in the audience who are interested in footwear design in particular. 
So okay. do you have advice for students who want to go that path other than yeah. continue to draw sneakers every day? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so my, the first thing is um, there really aren't any sneaker design schools. Um, there are a couple of academies that can be found across the, the world. I think it's, it's an interesting design problem, right? Because the site never changes. It's always a human foot. But the, the dynamism of what that site is doing, it's playing a game of football, it's playing a game of basketball, it's playing tennis, it's going for a marathon run, it's wrestling, it's you name it. And my advice to you would be uh, look online, look on Instagram, you know, begin to get your hand and your mind wrapped around the basic gestures of the foot. And then exploring the abstraction of those, those gestures. You think about a, a traditional piece of footwear, there's really a three parts to it. There's the outsole, the interface between the sneaker and the surface. Then there's the midsole, which is the, the, the piece that moderates whatever you're running or walking or playing on and your foot. And then there's the upper, which is basically the enclosure. And so those are the three parts that we think about. And I would encourage all, all of you to think, you know, the side view is important. The top down view, the, the, the toe view is important. And then the three quarter view. So we, 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 I have said, I believe that sneakers are really more dynamic sculptures, that they're, they're moving in a direction with technology to be hyper expressive and at the same time, wildly imaginative. So. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get stuck on the nostalgia of what a sneaker has been. Mm -hmm. I would, I would savor what a sneaker could be, because we are exploring material-wise, gesturally with new technologies, whole new arenas of ways of designing sneakers, which is exciting. And I'm, it's great to hear that there's some design <laughs> sneaker designers out in the space. Um, I'd be happy to. Um, I'd be happy to continue that conversation. Awesome, that's super helpful. Um, I have another like maybe practical set of questions around the, the design process at Nike. Um, so there's some questions about how are decisions made to move forward with a product line from conception to execution. And then also some questions about what's the relationship between the role of the designer and then the other participants at Nike. So whether that's the marketer or the legal teams or um, sales teams. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I believe Nike is a design company first. Mm. Um, and it's not that I don't believe we need accountants and legal folks, we certainly do, but um, every single year, our business model starts with zero sales. Okay, we don't have an installed base like many companies do. So to get us to be a company who creates desire and designs desire, uh, that's, that's our job. And, and I don't mean that strictly as a capitalistic or consumerist perspective. I mean that as a problem solving. How do we, how do we continuously move the needle and improve our products over and over again. Again, better is temporary. What did we learn? What didn't work? How can we improve and change that for the next season, the next collection? Um, procedurally, you know, the way that we, we operate here is um, a few of us in my leadership team do a year plus out looking at, okay, so what's coming? What are we interested in? Where is form and materiality and composition going? We work with some amazing outside collaborators. I've got friends all over the world who are artists and designers and thinkers. And we're tapping into the zeitgeist. So where, where is this all gonna go? And then we, we package this into a creative direction, which is primarily one of my most important jobs. Mm -hmm. And that direction then informs the thousand designers of a point of view and a way to think about an upcoming season. And then, we, then we're off to designing. And our designers do, uh, a lot of hands-on analog work and a ton of digital work. And what I love now more than ever is those two worlds are just colliding back and forth because we're not yet making or selling non-fungible token sneakers. We, we might in the future, but as of now they're physical products. So 
there's a physicality to the way that we design. Um, and then we have business partners who help us understand the cost of goods and materials. We have developers who help us build the products. And then we have sales teams who help us sell, sell the products and merchants who bring these products into our store. And because as a designer, I kind of see tip to tail, I start the season and then I end the season by thinking about our stores and our, our e-commerce as a tapestry. How do I fill these ideas in to a physical space or a digital space? So when the customer comes into our, our company, they get this grand view of who we are and, and how we think and, and what matters to us. And then how do we you know, bring them along the journey of make sure that they know we're there to serve them with these products. I love the idea of um, you know, how every bit and piece that you design comes together to tell a story, whether that's an online story or an in-person story. It's kind of this I don't know, I have this idea, this image in my head of like a mosaic of sneakers that tells the story of Nike, which sounds very- I, I, That's great, sir, because I, you know, I oftentimes will describe my job as more of a film director, right? So I'm actually not behind the camera. I'm not in front of the camera. I'm not the writer. <laughs> I'm the director. Yeah. And, and, and the director is trying to get to a tapestry and a story arc for the, for the season, for the year. And that tapestry really, I, I hope is engaging mm -hmm. and it shares with our communities and our, our athletes. Here, here's what we're thinking. This is what's interesting to us. I love that. Um, yeah, you just think about all the threads that come together. Um, okay, I know we're close to running out of time, but there's a couple more questions that I want to make sure. And then I think the audience really wants to know. Um, I'll start with mine. Um, so I'm an academic. I teach uh, students from mostly design disciplines, but also across the university. Um, and I'm curious from your perspective, what are the things that we should make sure to be teaching our students, whether it's a class that we should have or a skill that they need in order to position them to be leaders of the design world for the next five to 10 years out? Yep. Um, I, I think, you know, and it's not just this moment, Sarah, I, I'm a big believer of empathic design. And I believe that teaching empathy to designers uh, as they're learning their vocation is absolutely critical. Um, because again, at the end of the day, a designer has a social contract with somebody else. We are solving problems for other people. And, you know, the way that I see us teaching uh, empathic design here is to, to bring differences and, and diversity and, and texture to the table simultaneously, because I have witnessed firsthand that that diversity of background, of ethnicity, of, mm -hmm. uh, of experience, of, of uh, orientation, et cetera. What I've seen that do when it's brought together in a creative table is it creates the, the knowledge of wanting to know more, which is empathy. And that is like, well, how can I get into my, the head of a consumer? How can I help this consumer uh, understand what her needs really are? How can I channel that into a solution set? And then of course, empathy is the mother's milk of curiosity and curiosity is the backbone of creativity. Mm -hmm. And creativity is how we get to innovation and innovation is our advantage. So I, I think, you know, institutions that, that I'm talking to today, it, it is about how do we teach and train creative empathy, knowing more, widening the aperture, going deeper, finding more depth and more dimension in those whom we serve, setting our egos aside and putting that uh, front and center. I think that's really good. And then the only other thing I would add there, um, this is more, more of a, a practical thinking is, you know, the world is digital now more than ever. So, you know, I, I am not a digital native. I am late to the digital. Uh, in fact, I use pen to become more digital. But the balancing of teaching an analog physicality, your hand and your eye and the make and the touch and the sensations of a designer combined with the power of calculus and the power of the emergent computer tools, I, I think, you know, Young, young designers today, that is something that I would put these two worlds together. They're not separate in my mind. They're, they're, they're both exploratory 
And, and the fidelity that you can examine something in the computer today is, is off the charts. But for many folks, the, the realization of that fidelity is in the make of something. And the tools of making are changing rapidly too. So all, all that as a way of saying empathy, analog and digital, helping us find more relevance, find more meaning, find uh, new aesthetics in white space. That's what I believe our world is looking for us to do. That's awesome. And just for my students who are in the audience, I did not know he was going to say that, nor did I tell him to say that. But I'm a big proponent of empathy as, as a critical kind of linchpin for creativity as well. So I appreciate hearing you say that. And I think the way that you talk about the combination of the digital and analog is so important, which is like, how can you use those tools on the front end of your process to inspire creativity together? And then how can you use them throughout the process to inform each other and to make your process and your product better, better is I think really interesting. The, the, I mean, the, my, my notion of, of that landscape of tomorrow is quantum creativity. And, and when we say quantum creativity, what I mean is your human imagination, you know, with rocket fuel, that is this upcoming emerging tools and technologies and, and the, exponential iterations that we can do as designers is just breathtaking, right? And I, I also believe that uh, as of today, artificial or autonomous design doesn't exist. And, and I know data can't dream, but we can. We, and we can enlist the technology and the calculus with our dream combined. I, I, that's where we find new ground. So using the human brain to drive where the data goes and where the AI goes rather than, I know that some of us are a little bit afraid of, of the algorithms and what they're going to do with us. Uh, yeah, yes. And I, I don't, yes, at times I share that, but designers of tomorrow will really be designers who think through the parameters of data and establishing those parameters in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And then it'll always come down to an eye and a feel and, a, and an intuition around, is this right? Is this, is this interesting? I won't even say look good because I don't think that's the goal. I think, is it interesting? Is it provocative? Does it, does it solve a problem? I mean, that to me is the most important thing. And, and I, I'm lucky I get to see some of the world's best students and teachers, uh, mm -hmm. faculty, and and practitioners and uh, the things that I see coming um, are quite profound. It's, it's the search for a next nature, if you will. And that next nature's expression uh, will change and keep evolving, developing completely new species of ideas. That's really interesting. So the potential for technology. So um, another question that, I don't know, might be a good one to end on or not, we'll see, um, is, is so you've talked a lot about the opportunities around sustainability, around connecting with um, many different kinds of athletes, about leveraging technology. Um, what's like a problem or a challenge that you're thinking about that you feel like Nike um, really needs to get after, and your team really needs to to wrap its head around for the next several years? Um, yeah, I, I kind of go back to the statement that. I had made earlier the, the notion of you know better is temporary. Yeah, mm -hmm. we continue to push from a, a sport performance lens. How your birth anatomy is no longer your athletic destiny. That's where Nike comes in. We build appliance and apparatus to have everybody find their own potential, whatever that may be. Uh, that may be breaking world record. That may be just enjoying a hike. Um, I find that really powerful because I don't think there is a peak athleticism yet. Yeah. Um, I, I, in fact, I, I don't believe in that. I believe in looking at um, Darwin's curve of evolution and then bumping at the apex Moore's law of computing. So this calculus that's coming, this new, new inputs, new outputs, I think will change the anatomy of the body and change it for the better and even more like exploration. So that, that's one. I, the, the second one, Sarah, and we, we've touched on this is, you know, we have nearly 8 billion people on the planet. So how do we vanguard humanity? And how do we position sports and making sport a daily habit 
so critical to the human experience. And uh, a part of our job is to create access for those who don't participate in sports. So I'm very interested in finding um, a way to get to any, all, and every athletes of every ambition, of every ability, of every body type, so that more people can feel um, the hope and the positivity of finding what that potential is. I, I find that to be uh, a huge part of my work now. I love that. I love the um, the encompassing nature of that vision. And like sport is so important to people from so many perspectives, whether it's health or play or self-esteem. And so thinking about how do we kind of enable people um, is really exciting. And it's really been exciting to see the work that you guys are doing um, in multiple directions. Um, I think we're out of time. Um, I want to thank the audience for some really good questions and John for some really good conversation. Um, and I will hand it over to Charlotte to wrap us up. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, audience. Yeah, thank you so much, John and Sarah. That was very, very insightful and a wonderful conversation. We really appreciate you taking the time out to talk to all of us. Um, just a couple of closing comments and housekeeping. Um, we hope everyone will join us alumni weekend when we'll be hosting two great virtual talks. The first will be the design legacy of Julian Abel held on Friday, May 14th from 11 to 12 p.m. Uh, join Frederick Steiner, Dean and Paley Professor of Weizmann School of Design for a discussion on the work and legacy of Julian Abel with Amy Cohen and Abel's great grand nephew, Peter Cook. The talk will be moderated by Mark Garner. The second event will be Caring for the Nation's First Hospital on Saturday, May 15th from 2 to 3 p.m. Founded in 1751 by Benjamin Franklin and Dr. Thomas Bond, the Pennsylvania Hospital is the oldest continuously operating hospital in the United States, making it an architectural treasure as well as a vital community resource. Conservation experts at the Weizmann School began a year-long study to create a conservation management plan to ensure the long-term integrated care of the hospital's mission and legacy. This talk will include Weizmann lecturer Kesha Fong, project manager Sarher Codillo, and Weizmann associate professor and architectural historian Aaron Runch, who will be joined by the P Pennsylvania Hospital curator and lead archivist Stacey Peoples. Uh, links to find out more and to register, I think, have been added to the chat. Uh, yes, they have. And thank you all again for attending today's talk. And thanks again, John and Sarah.